Wow. Well, it's just, uh, it's really just great to be here. Um, actually, at my age, it's great to be anywhere. But um, I, I'm going to talk about something really different uh, than what we just heard. And this is, uh, you know, battling the coral reef crisis uh, in, in the little island of Bonaire. Um, as many of you probably know, coral reefs are really, uh, they may be the most endangered ecosystem on, on Earth. And that's really not news. Um, but the question is, what can we do about it? And uh, what I'd like to really uh, touch on are a couple things. A little bit about Caribbean and, and their coral reefs. You know, Bonaire and what's up with their coral reefs. And, uh, and really listening and talking and applying science for management and resilience in Bonaire's reefs. And, uh, and I think that's where the optimism comes from. So I, I really want to just start out with sort of the way things were. Um, this is me in St. Croix uh, in 1972, and things were really different uh, then. Um, but what was amazing uh, is coral was everywhere. And uh, while I was working on my dissertation, I watched a, a living coral reef uh, literally die within a decade and flatten. It just, uh, it was amazing. A Caribbean reef decline was widespread. Uh, coral disease, disease of sea urchins, uh, global warming, ocean acidification. You know, you've heard these stories, so is it time to write the obituary? Well, in fact, an obituary was written uh, by Roger Bradbury, um, and, and he wrote, world's coral reefs have become zombie ecosystems, neither dead nor truly alive in any functional sense, and on a trajectory to collapse within a human generation. He wasn't invited to this meeting. Um, <laughs> But, but the question is, really, uh, are, are all coral reefs dying? Are they on a trajectory of collapse? And uh, that's really what I'd like to get into. I mean, really, zombie ecosystems? Come on. So, so in Jamaica, this is some photographs I took in 1978. And uh, it was a coral-dominated system. This is a, what a coral reef should look like. Within 10 years, this is what it looked like. Um, as a matter of fact, that's the same coral. And, the, the coral had actually shifted to become a, a seaweed reef. Um, and I went back 28 years later, and it's still a seaweed reef. It is locked into that state. Uh, and that's not good. Um, so Jeremy Jackson gathered a bunch of people together. We, we uh, looked at coral reefs throughout the Caribbean. He gathered 35,000 reef studies over the last 30 years. And let me summarize this for you. Um, we went, if you look at coral abundance and if you look at algal abundance, seaweed abundance, okay? We went from high coral cover uh, and low seaweed abundance in the 1970s to a situation where we had low coral cover and a lot of seaweed. And what has not happened, is not known in the Caribbean, is any reef going in the other direction actually improving. So in a nutshell, what we're looking at are coral reefs have become seaweed reefs. And uh, this is a photograph I took in Antigua relatively recently, the Bahamas. There are, or there is at least one exception, and that's in Bonaire. And this is what introduces us to this particular topic. You know, what's going on in Bonaire? It's a little island off the coast of Venezuela. It's pretty tiny, 20 miles long. And, uh, and I've been working there uh, really for a good part of 20 years, working towards solutions, monitoring the health of, of the coral reefs and using science to steer management, uh, and there are, that's where the causes of optimism are. So what's different about Bonaire? Um, it has very little seaweed, and you ask the question, why? And one of the things that will strike you is that there's a lot of parrotfish, and when you look at parrotfish broadly, these guys are the, are the herbivores. These are the deer, the rabbits of this marine system and they eat the seaweed. So if you go to a place like Jamaica, which is the Geneva standard of a degraded reef, you find very few parrotfish and, uh, and a lot of seaweed. Bonaire is just the opposite. And this is a very interesting problem because this is where the community uh, becomes important. I was talking to a lot of the fishermen in the area and the fishermen had stories and photographs they wanted to share with me about the way Bonaire used to be. And uh, they showed me these pictures of this huge fish that they had speared. And as a matter of fact, it wasn't just fish. They were spearing everything. Um, and they're so proud of, of, the, of you know, what they were able to shoot and their spear guns that they included them in the photographs. 
Um, within a decade, uh, really the big fish started to disappear. And in fact, it was the fishing community who agreed in 1971 to stop spearfishing in Bonaire. And that's really amazing. I don't know of any other examples of that. The reason why this really matters is that parrotfish are big, easy targets for, uh, for spearfishing. And, uh, and so they would succumb to that. So as soon as they stopped spearfishing in the 1970s, um, you actually had a pretty good population of these herbivores that could keep the reefs clean. So we have this system where you've got a lot of herbivorous fish and, uh, in Bonaire, and they keep the seaweed low. But most of the Caribbean has got a ton of seaweed. So what's wrong with seaweed carpets? Well, they stress corals. They, they reduce the feeding of the corals. They poison the corals. They actually have chemicals that poison the corals. They smother them. They re reduce the reproductive output. Uh, they make the corals more disease prone. And uh, it makes the reefs hostile to baby corals. So they are, in fact, baby killers. Um, so they make the reef less resilient. Um, and these are the things that are really critical if you're going to have any kind of a disturbance or a stress. How do you maintain resilience? In, in a nutshell, seaweed are bad hombres. Um, and so. Uh, Thinking about this, uh, I published a paper with a, with a colleague of mine about the ecological feedback loops. And I know you won't be able to read this, but let me just talk you through it. it it's basically thinking about what really matters that make an e this ecosystem work. S the grazing pressure from parrotfish uh, actually keeps the, al the seaweed low in abundance. And because of that, the baby corals can thrive. And as the baby corals grow up, they gobble up space, and that kind of concentrates the herbivores and makes that a little bit stronger. As the coral grows up, it makes a complex reef. The complex reef is actually a good nursery habitat for parrotfish and other fish, and they recruit. And you've got a system that actually, with these kind of positive feedbacks, can maintain itself, and it can withstand disturbances and be resilient. When you take out the, the things like the grazers, you actually create this entire negative feedback, and you end up with these reefs, as I showed you, that are collapsed algal-dominated systems that get locked into this alternative, unhealthy state. OK. So can we put ideas, that bit of science uh, about how coral reef ecosystems work, into management for the coral reefs? And um, for that, uh, I think it's a, a the, the bigger picture here was working with and learning from the stakeholders, the fishermen and the people who live in Bonaire, working with the managers. Many of them are actually part of the community. Building a scientific information base that includes their ideas as well as the science that we can bring to this and to create a durable network that will help management. So I started making these, uh, these reports every other year with my students. Uh, this is 2003, and we said, gee, the coral cover is high, seaweed abundance is low, herbivory is, is, is high, but, uh, and there's low nutrients. That's all good. <laughs> But there's relatively few herbivores. And so they asked me to speak to their government, which I did, went to public meetings, uh, made presentations. And we talked to the fishing community about what we can do about the fact that there are really fewer fish out there. And they were very animated about you know, what was good and what, what they would uh, go along with. The, uh, the, the park ranger actually is from the community. Uh, all the rangers are. So the connection between the fishing community, as their fishermen on the left, um, is, a, is a really good one. But what we were hearing is uniformly that the fish are gone. So what are we going to do about that? The big fish were gone. And so the fishing community agreed to create these closed areas, these marine reserves adjacent to the hotels. And it went through, actually, the vote with the fishing community was the easiest thing to get through. It took a lot longer to get it through the, um, uh, the Netherlands government. But in any case, it finally did uh, come to pass and um, fish protection areas uh, exist. We conducted a number of scientific projects. We had stuff in the newspapers. And so we're trying to apply management uh, science to improve management, because these are very complex ecosystems. But if you study them and you can figure out where the pressure points are, what are the few factors that drive the resilience of these ecosystems, then you can kind of work surgically. So we should be monitoring and managing for those key drivers. And OK, so how do you do that? In 2005, uh, the Marine Park asked me to develop a monitoring protocol. And what I suggested was keep it simple, keep it focused on known drivers and indicators of reef health, 
monitor trends in the drivers of reef health, and uh, this is what we came up with. This is really not rocket science here. Positive trends and negative trends, okay? It's a coral reef, okay? If corals are increasing in abundance, that's good. If they're decreasing in abundance, that's bad. And so seaweed's the same sort of story. You want less seaweed. You want herbivores. You want big parrotfish. You want to have a lot of baby corals, and because the baby corals are going to add to the, the coral cover. Keep it simple. Keep it straightforward. We had really four drivers that we're watching here. So we conducted this kind of surveys at 11 different sites. Um, and in 2007, uh, our report showed a troubling trend. And really, uh, the no-take reserves were then established the following year in 2008, but we continued our monitoring. So what we end up seeing is the coral cover from 1999, which is actually the very first study, to 2009 was pretty solid and, and steady. That's good. But the seaweed was actually increasing, and it wasn't high by Caribbean standards, but that's a concern. Parrotfish abundance, they started to drop a little bit. And what, has, what was going on was trapping was starting to pick up. Now, parrotfish, they, they swim with their little pectoral fins, and they, uh, they sleep at night, and they like to sleep in caves. It happens that fish traps are too much like caves. They go into these traps, and they sometimes die in these traps. So uh, baby corals were also declining in abundance. And so our report in 2009 was, we're really seeing a lot of negative factors here. And so we said, this is a, a problem. And you, we suggested that they ban fish traps and they ban parrot fishing. They did that in 2010. They phased out fish traps, banned parrot fishing. And then something uh, very unexpected happened. Um, there was a massive bleaching event, and it was a stress test for this uh, system. Uh, they they uh, suffer bleaching, they throw out their zooxanthellae, and the coral actually showed a significant decline. The seaweed showed a spike upward, and the parrotfish abundance was actually not changing. And so we were seeing this as a really unfortunate situation of negative trends. 2011, we said that we saw that the bleaching had killed the corals, but uh, seaweed was increasing. And it made me think, for all the work we've done, in the words of Groucho Marx, the operation was a success, but the patient died. <laughs> we still had this durable network. And in 2013, we started seeing evidence. Uh, our, our report said causes for optimism. We saw in 2015, the subtitle said, slow but steady signs of resilience. And now, a month, with, just a month ago, we came up with the following uh, with 2017 data. So the bleaching event happened in 2010. There's a 2011, 13, 15, and we're back up to where we were in 2017 for coral. Seaweed abundance has continued to go down. The parrotfish abundance is now spiking upward, and the baby corals are also spiking upward. We are actually seeing every one of these uh, things that we're managing for go positive. This, we think, is the first documented case of resilience of a Caribbean coral reef. So I think we can conclude by saying that not all cor coral reefs are dying. Uh, Bonaire's reefs are not on a trajectory of collapse. We can just say no to zombies. And really, I think at the end of the day, this is the first resilient reef in the Caribbean. That's optimistic. It suffered a massive bleaching event, recovered fully. It shows that local management, working with local communities, can protect these beleaguered ecosystems. It also shows it takes a village and more than a decade to create durable marine conservation. With that, I thank you all. <laughs>